Today is August 26, 2021, and my guest is author and professor Norena Hertz of University College London. Her latest book is The Lonely Century, Coming Together in a World That's Pulling Apart. Norena, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me on, Russ. Well, let's start with a really simple, basic question. Actually, not so simple as it turns out. What do you mean by loneliness? Uh, you you mentioned early on in the book that you're going to give a broader use a broader definition than is commonly used. So, what is your underlying um, concept that, you, that you're talking about in this book? When I talk about loneliness, what I'm talking about is a sense of feeling disconnected, disconnected from friends, from family, from those closest to you, but also disconnected in a broader sense, disconnected from your fellow citizens disconnected from the government, disconnected from your political leaders, disconnected from your employers. So um, I'm using loneliness in a broader sense um, than it's used in common parlance. And yet there is um, precedent for this wider definition of loneliness with thinkers as um, far ranging as Hannah Arendt to Emil Durkheim, also taking a um, kind of broader definition of the subject. So it's that craving for connection and intimacy, um, that craving for being seen, for being heard, for being visible that so many people today do not feel. So this episode is a uh pairs nicely with the recent interview we did with I did with uh, Johan Hari in his book Lost Connections and there he's looking at the role of lost connections in potentially explaining depression uh the clinical depression but this your book is more about how we got here and what we might do to to deal with it uh, I want to quote Thoreau who said uh, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation obviously loneliness is not a new phenomenon why do you think it's um, growing what evidence do we have that it's growing or that it's uh, some kind of crisis let's start with that so we only really started measuring loneliness in an empirical scientific way in about the 1970s when uh, scientists at UCLA came up with a whole host of questions, which became the gold standard um, for really interrogating whether somebody felt lonely. Interestingly, you never ask in these questions, are you lonely? Because loneliness does have a stigma. So often if you're asked, are you lonely? People say no. But there's about 20 questions which people are typically asked. And what we see is since the 1970s, since it's been measured, um, a steady increase in the numbers of people who are feeling lonely, really accelerating uh, this century, especially uh, since 2010, and then again, especially since the coronavirus. So, um, so, and we can and we can see this in longitude when we're comparing uh, data. For example, there's been studies which compare how lonely 10 to 16 year olds feel. Um, and they've done it and they've asked these same questions and done these same investigations you know, repeated times over the years. And we do see very s significant increases, especially um, since 2010. But even I argue, um, you know, where we really start seeing this rise in a perceptible way is earlier, is um, in really from about the 1980s onwards is what we see. And and just just because my... Um, viewers and listeners might not be aware um, of just how big, how significant a problem we're talking about. Um, you know, we're talking about in the United Kingdom, three in five 18 to 24 year olds saying um, even before the pandemic that they felt lonely often or sometimes half of 10 to 16 year olds saying that they felt lonely often or sometimes we're talking about Two in five Americans saying that they feel lonely often or sometimes. And these are figures even before the pandemic. Post-pandemic, it's got significantly worse, with some countries reporting around 50% of the population currently feeling lonely. Uh, just as a bit of a nitpick, um, I, I, Please. I, I don't consider these attempts to measure this really subtle and rich problem or challenge of the human condition to be so scientific. Um, we have gathered data on it. This is true. Uh, sometimes and often are very different. I, I'm happily married. 
I think I have some friends. But if he asked me, do I sometimes feel lonely? I'd probably say yes. Uh, in many days, many years of my life, I would have answered yes to that question. There is a certain, um, again, it, it is part of the human condition to, to some extent. We are inevitably isolated from those around us and long to connect with them. And I think the crisis, or I don't know if you would call it a crisis, I think you would, um, the, the social challenge of loneliness and the personal challenge of loneliness is that that's new is that it appears to be, uh, and emphasize that, it appears to be more severe. It appears to be that we are more isolated from each other uh, in many, many different ways, as you as you pointed out. And in, go ahead. Yeah, we even see this, I mean, you know, we see this kind of very clearly if we look at data, for example, on how many friends people say that they have, you know, that's a, a very clear data point, I think, because, you know, what we see is that currently um, around one in five um, American millennials say that they don't have a single friend at all. And that's about double what it was a decade ago. So, you know, there are some data points that I think do really express very clearly that there's a real problem here and one that's growing. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. I mean, I think, I think the, I just think we should overstate the precision of it or ability to, to chart a trend. I, but I do think the general trend seems to be, I was going to say positive, but you're negative, depending on how you want to, what yes. you want to put on the axis. And, and you, of course, as, as we would expect, as anyone would thinking about this technology and, and, Partially, especially in the last 15 years, has played either a role in causing this or is a response in, in some ways to it. But I, I do want to challenge this notion that it's a problem. Uh, I do think it's a problem. I agree with you. So, But I want to give you a chance to respond to what, what sometimes my listeners respond. And of course, they're not a random subset of, of the world population. Two-thirds of them are in the United States. Uh, all of them are in the habit of putting earphones on or some other device to listen to someone on their pretty much on their own. Those some of my listeners listening with their family or, or with friends. But most people, I think, listen to podcasts by themselves. So this, this is a selected, non-random audience. But they'll say when, when I decry the isolating effects of technology on this program, they get mad sometimes and say, I like it. I, I like being alone. I like being by myself with my YouTube videos and my uh, Instagram and TikTok and, and my cell phone, my smartphone. It's fun. I don't need people as much as maybe other people did in the past. What do you respond to that? So I'm really glad that you raised that question because firstly, it's really important to be clear that feeling lonely is not the same as being on your own and being alone. And, um, you know, when you choose to be alone, when aloneness um, is an expression of your agency, then it often doesn't feel lonely. I, I'm a writer and thinker. I spend a lot of time on my own and I love being on my own. And at those times I'm not lonely. And yet I have experienced in my life periods, moments when I have felt that I've craved connection, that I've craved visibility, um, that I've um, wanted to be heard and felt that that hasn't been met. And when I have been lonely. So I think it's important to differentiate that and, you know, say, yes, I, it's important, I think, that people feel comfortable doing things on their own and being alone. And this, this isn't about trying to stop that. This is about... Uh, acknowledging that there's something else going on, which is um, people who want to feel connected, an increasing number of people who want to feel connected and not having that feeling of connection met. Yeah, I was thinking about the word recently that I don't think I've said it maybe ever on this program, which is solitude. Solitude is a, I assume it comes from sort of solo, being alone or one, and solitude's lovely. Um, if it's what you want. Mm -hmm. I want to pick one more example, though, from current culture that I think is a, a phenomenon potentially of, of um, generational difference and perhaps not as frightening as, as it actually is. For my friends and myself, my wife, when we look at young people socializing, mm -hmm. either at a party or uh, out at a, at a restaurant, and everyone's looking at their phone instead of interacting with each other, we find that alarming, disturbing, scary, <laughs> dark. And I don't think the I'm not sure the people on their phones feel that way. I don't think I don't know if they 
Some of them do, obviously. You know, we've, we've talked to a number of guests in the past about the fact that it's hard for people to separate from social media and they, they, they have something that you might call an addiction. Uh, but how do you feel about that? Don't, there is a, do you feel there's a cultural differ, a generational difference in how these cultures of, of interacting with the device uh, is going? I interviewed many teenagers as part of my research for the book because I wanted to understand how they felt um, and how they felt um, socially, whether they saw social media as something that was aiding, um, how connected they felt or not. And in line with the very clear correlation, not necessarily causation, but correlation that we do see between rising levels of loneliness amongst young people and social media usage. Um, in line with that, many of the teenagers I interviewed talked very movingly about why it was that their social media usage made them feel alone. I'm remembering um, Peter, for example, a 14-year-old boy who told me about how he would post on Instagram and then be waiting, waiting, hoping for somebody to like when, one of his posts. And when they didn't really be berating himself and saying, you know, I feel so invisible. Um, why is no one seeing me and really berating himself? What am I doing wrong? Or I think about Claudia, a 16-year-old girl who told me about how um, her friends at school had said that they weren't going to go out and hang out after school. And she was in her room and she was scrolling on her social media feeds and she saw her friends all having fun without her and her exclusion was so visible to her and how painful it was and how she hid in her room um, for a week. So um, social media is, you know, it's not, of course, that kids weren't excluded in the past, uh, but the difference is that the exclusion, first of all, nowadays is very public. Um, secondly, the adult in the child's life, um, whereas in the past, they might have realized this was going on and intervened. So a teacher might have seen a child not being asked to sit with others at lunch, or a parent might have noticed their kid not being invited to do something because so much of the socializing is actually happening now on screen. Um, if you're excluded from it, no one really knows and can intervene. But, um, but also they talked a lot about, and the data again uh, supports this, the, um, how isolating it was to experience, um, to directly experience bullying or hatred um, online. And an astonishing number of young people have experienced this in the United Kingdom. A third of uh, 18 to 24 year old women have experienced abuse on Facebook, for example. I mean, that's a very significant number. So, um, so those are, I think, a few of the reasons which help explain um, why we do see a correlation that up until I'd say about a year and a half ago, it was very hard to establish whether it was you know, just a correlation. Was it that lonelier people used social media and so anyway would have been lonely? Or was there some causal relationship? And then about, I guess about two years ago now, um, was a very important study done at Stanford University that I write about in the book where it was a real gold standard of a study where they had 3,000 um, students, 1,500 were told to use Facebook as usual, 1,500 were charged with actually deleting it from their devices and not use it at all. And they um, tracked for two months what happened to the two groups, so the control group, the one who was using it like usual, and the other group. And the other group were significantly more lonely and significantly, um, sorry, the group who were the group who stopped using it were significantly less lonely and significantly happier um, once they did so. And also, interestingly, they did much more in person with friends and family. So it wasn't that they just then spent lots of time on other sites on the internet because they weren't banned with using the internet. Um, they actually did more in person. And we do know from research uh, that in-person, face-to-face interactions are qualitatively superior. So um, the interaction that, and this isn't, you know, I really, this isn't kind of an older person 
Scott's perspective on this, you know, the research on how we process information and how we develop feelings like empathy, um, the neuroscience behind it makes it clear that uh, it's just when you're face to face with someone in a room, when you smell them, when you see their full body language, when you um, kind of really can see their eye movement, you know, which even on a Zoom call is hard to do, uh, you can become much more connected. You're more likely to feel a deeper connection and also be more empathetic. And so connections that are happening on your on their phones are likely to be shallower as a result and therefore um, be part of the problem for sure. Well, you talk in your book about something that I think about a lot, which is the loss of skills that people might have from in face-to-face -face interaction from having less of it in their lives. And they get, I mean, I think face-to-face -face interaction is just difficult. A lot of people have always, have many people have told me, oh, you must, you know, have better interviews when they're literally face-to-face, -face, not over Zoom, but they're literally face-to-face. -face. And that's not been my experience at all. I think a lot of people find it comforting to be on the, on the phone, say, or on audio only, because they don't have to read the body signals, and then I don't have to project them as the host, and you don't have to notice whether I'm paying attention or not. And, and I think, you know, if I'm checking my notes or worrying about the time, uh, and you're trying to have a conversation with me, it's jarring. And so... I actually think sometimes phone or just audio only is actually a more intimate form of conversation for people who struggle with social cues and even people are pretty good at them. But I think the more general and interesting question is whether those that ability is sort of uh, atrophying, atrophying is atrophying, atrophying, atrophying as um, uh, people use them less, and especially for young people and I who who are growing up in an era where they 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 could. They do much less, presumably, than than their mm -hmm. parents' generation. Do you think that's true? And and um... it was actually one of the impetuses for me starting to research the subject of loneliness uh, was an observation um, that my students were seemed to be struggling more with face to face interaction. I saw it when I set them group assignments, and um, and I noticed that you know, a considerable number seem to be challenged with this face-to-face, in-person um, group assignment that was you know, very much the norm when I was a student. And I actually raised it with a um, friend who is president of one of America's prestigious um, universities. And he said that at his university, they were really noticing it. And it was so bad there that they were running how to read a face in real life classes for their incoming students where literally, you know, there was a class where you would be told if you're in a room with someone and they frown or their body language is looking kind of all defensive, you know, this means it's going badly or, you know, if they're beaming and they're all welcoming, it's going well, which is quite, quite something. Um, there's also an uh, uh, anecdotal evidence from uh, teachers kindergarten teachers, we call it in the UK. I don't know if it's the same yeah. in the US. Um, yeah, kindergarten teachers that they're seeing. Um, so young young children, children aged four or five, um, coming in school with noticeably lesser face-to-face um, -face socializing skills, um, which, um, which they think is, in, which they have attributed in part to being um, the kids spending, spending more time on their screens, even at that age, but also, of course, their parents spending time oh. on their screens. Because this was something that the teenagers I interviewed for my book would always say to me, look, it's not just us guys, it's you guys yeah, it's true. on your phone the whole time. So not imparting then those skills. So I, I think there's something really real here that, um, that we should take very seriously. So I've, made the observation before on this program that that a musical that's filmed with a straight on camera is remarkably boring and hard to watch on TV or on film, whereas an actual musical live in person is radically different. And whatever explains, I don't know what fully explains that difference in sensation and perception, but I think it's related to how we react to people on Zoom. In mm -hmm. theory, 
you and I are having a face-to-face -face conversation. I mean, really, is it is it that much different? The fact that that I see you next to me, you know, I can look into your eyes. Like you say, it's hard to see the eyes, but I'm getting a lot of body language. I'm getting a lot of facial expression. Um, and yet, it's not close to the same, which is a little bit weird when you think about mm -hmm. it, because in theory, the only difference is that this is clearly something like television. It's like me watching you in a film mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to live. And and yes, if we were in the same room, it would be three dimensional. I would you would not look the you know. The, the lack of depth that I'm that I'm seeing, but I can imagine. I could. I know there's depth there. I know what it's like to sit in the room with a person, and yet somehow, it's a, di a radically different social experience to the extent that it's exhausting so to be on Zoom for long periods of time. I'm, I'm going to be. I'm going to be okay for this hour, Marina. <laughs> I think we're going to be fine. But in general, it's interesting how hard it is. As a human being, it's it's yeah. something I suspect primal or primitive about our senses, uh, but I don't think we fully understand that. Do you react to that? Yeah. So I think a few a few observations, and yes, after this past year and a half, I think so many of us are directly experiencing the Zoom fatigue and also, you know, a craving more in yeah, for human interactions. Yeah. For sure. uh, I think. You know, part of it is the actual, you know, the fact that we are distract, we are narcissistic creatures, and we are distracted by our own images, which which Good are point. up on the screen. You know, it's it's excellent my hair point. Okay, yeah. it's my makeup, etc. So, you know, so we're not present fully. It's as if we were having a conversation with a friend in a room, looking at our mirror with a mirror in front of us. So that's already going to be problematic. Um, secondly. Researchers have um, who neuroscientists who look at the way kind of mirror neurons work in our brains. So these are um, in real life when you're in a room with someone, what happens is when they smile um, at your brain. I'm just giving you know sketching this out in a very crude way, but basically, your in your brain you have neurons which will essentially mirror that that's going on. And then, and that's why if somebody smiles, you also feel a bit happier. If somebody is sad, you feel a bit sad as well. So it's going on in your brains. But in order for it to happen, there can't be this lag that we get, which is, you know, because we're on not great internet connections and there's a slight lag. Um, it doesn't work nearly so well when there's that lag. It needs to be absolutely in real time that you see someone and do it. So that's part of the problem as well. That we're just not, our brains aren't capable of connecting in exactly the same way because um, because we're missing that mirroring effect that we would get in real life. So that's another part of the problem. Um, and the other is just that you have to kind of focus in a way that is not that natural so we are we are performing on zoom you know to use your tv analogy in a much greater way than we would typically um because because we want to be heard we want to be seen so so we feel that we have to kind of perform more and again that creates um some degree of inauthenticity which we pick up I'm just going to say one more thing. It's kind of off the track, but it's sort of interesting to me, which is I, I do think the point about being able to see yourself is is, is not unimportant. Um, I don't keep track of how often I look at myself on Zoom, but I know that I do it. And mm -hmm. when I'm doing it, I'm watching exactly what you said. I'm, I'm trying to see, am I composing my face in an interesting, thoughtful way? Am I? And as soon as I do that, of course, I've stopped focusing on you. And uh, there's an inherent narcissism there. And it, it's a performance. And of course, life has a performative aspect when we're face to face as well. I, I have a certain feeling about how I'm holding my face or smiling or not smiling or looking intently or whatever it is. And certainly Zoom. Um, and by the way, I love Zoom. I think it's incredible and it's so much better than not zoom in, in covid times it's you know it's, it was a literal lifesaver i think for a lot of people to be able to see their parents and their children and um and it works remarkably well so i have nothing bad to say about it but it is a i think obviously a poor substitute but I, for real life and face to real face to face and i think this uh 
inherent, uh, the ability to see yourself is is a huge is a part of the problem. The other part still is this two dimensional thing, and I can't, I'm not quite sure what's driving that. But maybe smarter people than 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 me have than than me have uh, figured that out. I don't know. Also, it's very hard to make eye contact because to make eye contact, you actually have to look right. into the camera <laughs> rather right. than at you, and so you're never actually making eye contact. It's an excellent That's- point. It's an excellent point. And I, right, you can fake eye contact. I can look into the camera and think and, and think to myself, oh, she's thinking I'm looking into her eyes. Of course, I'm not. I'm looking into your camera. Exactly. So there's an inherent yeah, deception there. Let's, let's move on to the more um, uh, speculative, for me, speculative part of the book and the part I, I, I can't say I agreed with them for better or for worse, which is the cause of this. So, uh, w- Lay out what you think is the cause of this growth and disconnection and loneliness that that you're writing about. So I think there are a number of drivers. Um, you know, one obviously is that we do less with each other than in the past. And it, again, this isn't about saying that if you're on your own, it's you're necessarily going to be lonely. But we are doing more on our own, and if you are on your own, you are more likely to have episodes of loneliness. So. People live together less. They're less likely to get married. People are less likely to be members of parent-teacher associations, less likely to be members of trade unions, less likely to go to church or synagogue. So um, so people are doing less together, and that's clearly a factor. And this is something, obviously, that has been, you know, this isn't a brand new phenomenon. Professor Robert Putnam, of course, famously, you know, wrote um, about this, about 20 years ago now, I guess. Um, so um, bowling alone. So, but this has been, this is a real phenomenon that has been increasing and it's definitely part of the problem. Another part of the problem is technology, which we've already touched upon. So I won't go into that here, but I do see that as a driver and as kind of a key driver, but not the only one. The one where I know that you're the way where we where we are likely to have a point of difference. I'm excited to discuss with you our different points of views is um is the driver um that i the di- the economic driver the political economic driver that i um identify which is um neoliberal capitalism so to be clear i'm not anti-capitalism um i uh grew up in a family of entrepreneurs i definitely believe the the market is the best mechanism for innovation. I actually worked in Russia in the early 90s, just after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. And if there's anything to make someone very clear that that the alternative is bad, it's spending time in Russia in the early 90s. So um, I just want to preface my conversation with that. But I do believe that the particular form of capitalism that really took hold um, from the 1980s onwards, neoliberal capitalism, which is the um, version of capitalism that was subscribed to initially really by, or not initially, but in recent times by Ronald Reagan in the United States and by Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, the form of capitalism which uh, really valorized self-interest, um, hyper-competitiveness um, at the expense of um, thinking about others and the collective good, that that form of capitalism has a lot to answer for when it comes to how lonely and disconnected we currently feel. Because, you know, if you come to see yourself as a hustler rather than as a helper, as a taker rather than as a giver, um, as a competitor rather than a collaborator, isn't it inevitable that the world is going to feel more disconnected um, and that you will feel more disconnected from those in it, I would argue, yes. So part of it is the neoliberal mindset and how it's affected people, and that's part of the reason. Yeah, I so I, I don't buy that at all um, okay. for a lot of reasons. So let uh-huh. me try to lay it out a little bit Please. and you can respond. Um, go back, we can go back to Adam Smith. You mentioned him in your book that, yes. uh, you know, Smith gets unfairly 
associated with selfishness. Or Ayn Rand actually had a book called The Virtues of Selfishness. Um, certainly, Anna Smith would have had nothing to do with that idea. He didn't think selfishness was a virtue. No, he believed that people were self-interested. And that, again, has been true since um, Adam and Eve came out of the garden. Uh, it's as old as humanity. We're self we're, we're alone in the sense that we are physically not connected to other people once we're born, once the umbilical cord is cut. We're on our own. And we do spend the rest of our life, I think, trying to create those associations with each other. We do those in many ways. We do it in business. You can't be successful in business if you don't collaborate with your fellow employees or with your investors. Uh, business is inherently a collaborative business phenomenon. Oh, competitive also, of course. Um, we associate with each other voluntarily in what is called civil society. We create nonprofits and we do lots of things together in the modern world, pre-1980, post-1980. And I would be surprised if you would ever find anything in Maggie Thatcher, and Ronald Reagan, two people who I will defend only because they're dead, not on the program. I don't think they ever said that it's good to be a hustler and not a helper, to be a taker and not a giver, to, to be a, a competitor, not a collaborator. I, they, they believed in being a nice person. And both of them, by the way, spent a lot of time valorizing the family, which I think is part of the problem, as you alluded to in your opening remarks, although you almost mentioned it not at all in your book, that the death of the family, this traditional nuclear family in the West, the slow, it's not literally dead, but it's, it's, it's dying. The lack of the standard family structures that that were common until the last 40 years, that, that's not so good for togetherness. Now, you can argue there's virtues to it. I mean, you can argue we should have, it's been great. There are many benefits from it. I think there's, there's some truth to that. But it's got to be a big part of why we're lonely. I, I just don't see any reason to think that the cultural impact of neoliberal capitalism is real. I don't, huh. I don't even well, think we live well, in a neoliberal capitalist world. I don't even... I, and all of the, 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 these, the claims, you make them a little bit in your book about you know, austerity and reduced government. Government's bigger than ever. Where's the evidence that there's anything to this neoliberal capitalism tide that's engulfed us and made us lonely? So okay. I'll get off no, my I'll, soapbox. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a couple, of data. I'll give you yeah, a couple of data points to support my, um, yeah. my measured position. Um, first is... You know, you talk about, you know, no evidence at all to show that kind of culturally we um, see ourselves in these kind of super individualistic way. Actually, there is some great cultural evidence in terms of pop song lyrics, which we see since the 1980s, words such as we, us and our have steadily been supplanted by words like I, me and myself, which I see as a really interesting cultural um, phenomenon that helps um, show um, how we have steadily come to kind of view the world in an I-centric rather than we-centric way. Um, when it comes to um, your question about austerity and kind of, you know, it hasn't actually done um, played a part in how disconnected and lonely we are. We can, you know, a very obvious counter to that is the very significant depletion of what we might think of as the infrastructure of community that has taken place since 2008 across the globe. So since the 2008 financial crisis, when governments across the globe adopted pol policies of austerity, belt tightening, um, one of the things that they really defunded, and we see this in country after country, is things like public parks, public libraries, youth clubs, community centres. In the United Kingdom, 160 public libraries were closed down in 2019 alone. In the United States, federal funding for public libraries fell by a third um, over just a few year period. So, um, you know, people need physical places to be together, to do things together. And government, I believe, does have a role to play in helping to fund this at local and national levels. And we have seen a steady, a steady underfunding of that as well. There's also an element of neoliberalism um, of the kind of capitalism that we've adopted in the recent years. 
um, which is, of course, that uh, it has presided over a period of growing inequality. Now, inequality, um, you know, I don't have an objection to inequality per se, but I do have a um, problem when significant swathes of the population feel that they are being ignored. And I have a problem partly from a pragmatic position because we see that um, when people feel that they're ignored economically, um, when they feel disenfranchised economically in relative terms, um, they often turn to more extremist political parties for solutions, both on the left and on the right. Um, so I think that's another problem associated with neoliberal capitalism to raise. Um, you know, Margaret Thatcher was actually the um, member of parliament for the area in London that I grew up in. And, um, and um, you know, and you're, you're right in that the Conservative Party and at the same time um, the Republican Party on a under Ronald Reagan did um, fate and support the family. And I think um, I think the diminishment of the family is part of the problem here. But I would say that the solution to that doesn't mean that everyone should rush out and get married who isn't married yet and have kids. It's about how do we create meaningful bonds between people who are not necessarily blood ties? How do we encourage and also, um, you know, enable people to care for people who are not necessarily um, linked to them by blood? Uh, so, you know, you have not so much in the United States, but in you know, most of Europe, for example, you know, it's very standard practice to have for women after they have kids to um have paid time off by employers, significant paid time off by employers, um, maternity pay for the first, um, you know, six, nine months, even a year after a child's born. So paid at a decent rate to care. But we could, we could and should be thinking about how we extend the possibilities for people to care not only for their um, kin, but beyond. There's a lot to respond to there, it's very thoughtful. I, a couple things. I, I think what happened in the um, 80s and their aftermath is that governments like to talk about austerity and belt tightening, but they don't really do it. Um, governments are much, much bigger, either as certainly in absolute terms, corrected for inflation, of course, certainly meaning real spending is larger as a percentage of GDP. It's somewhat flat or growing in most West, most of the West. Obviously, there's bumps and changes during recessions or corona, but um, if you look at UK spending, government spending in the 2020 or 2019 before the pandemic, it's much larger than it was in 2010 or 20 or 2000. So it's not really an austere time. Um, libraries- question is, The question is, where is it being spent? And who is it true. being spent on? So libraries are dying out because people don't read books anymore. Whether we should have libraries, interesting question. Um, I, I do think there has to be ways, places for but people library, to- Libraries have been used, you know, really in very significant ways in recent years, not just, of course, for being places where people read books, but also being places where people often have access to computers, where they yep. have initiatives for- children so yeah as community cent centers i think so i don't know what's happened to libraries in in the west but i, I do think their challenge is um for people to get together in social ways and mm. libraries were one of those ways um, we had chris arnotti on the program whose book dignity deals with some of the issues you're talking about in a more granular uh, down down on the ground level um, and he talks about how McDonald's is a way in many communities for people to interact with each other. And you talk about that in your book, that small businesses, yeah. we can think about cafes and um, 
hardware stores. There's all kinds of places where people get together to barbershops. Sure, people have uh, the place you can go where people know your name. It's a it's a it's a nice thing. But uh, you know, I think the other part of this is the your the song lyrics are quite interesting. The the fact that we and us Mm -hmm. is less frequent maybe than than I and and um, singular lonelier uh, pronouns have become more common. The again the question is why. Um, religion, which you mentioned briefly, not so much in the book, is another example of where people used to find community, increasingly don't, especially in the last 10 years, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. and especially among young people. You know, it might be interesting, I don't know if anyone's done it, but to look in countries where there's, there is that maternity pay and other things that in theory might make people feel more connected, but also they don't have as much religion as they used to, and whether that is working as a way of creating more of a sense of belonging or and, and less sense of, and less a sense of loneliness. But I, I think the fundamental question here and is, you know, what do we do about it? And I, you know, I happen to like, I'm a big fan of the family and I'm, uh, I've, I'm suggesting that the loss of family connection and religious connection is 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 a huge part of this problem, not a, not a small part. But I don't think government should be trying to fix it. I don't I, I don't believe government should subsidize family or sub, ever subsidize religion. I'm now in a country where religion is subsidized, and I think it's it's bad for religion and it's bad for the country. And I say that as somebody who's a you know religious Jew. I I, I don't think that's the solution. I think the solution has to come from the bottom up. I think it has to come from us. Uh, you talk about the importance of kindness. I'm a big fan of kindness. I don't think it's in our hands. It's up mm-hmm. to you and me. It's not something that corporations foist on us to be cruel or neoliberal theorists foist on us. It's in the air and the water we breathe, and it's up to us to change it. And I think we can if we want to. Uh, certainly, each of us can make a small contribution to making the world a better place that way. But I, I just, I don't, you know, if you're going to put the blame on capitalism or business, and there's plenty of things businesses do that are that's awful. But if you can put on the quote the system, that the the ways of fixing that to me become very challenging. And you you propose some, so I'll you can respond to yeah. what I said, and you can propose some of those solutions if you'd like, and, and defend them. Yeah. So I mean, firstly, I totally agree with you that there's a lot that we need to do as individuals, and we should do. And this is you know where perhaps I. Um, you know, differ from um, some people who have, you know, raised the critique of neoliberal capitalism in that I also acknowledge, you know, we as individuals do have responsibilities, you know, and there are things we should do, and I'd love to talk about them later. But I also believe that there are things that um, governments can and should do, and also businesses. And just maybe to um, say a few words on businesses, um, One thing that came out very clear from my research was the extent to which loneliness is a problem for employers. Um, An employer in economic, uh, a problem in economic terms. Lonely workers are less productive, less efficient, less motivated, more likely to quit a company than a worker who isn't. Um, Somebody who doesn't have a friend at work is six times more likely to quit the company they work for than somebody who does, for example. So, you know, really loneliness is a big business issue that businesses would be well served to address from pragmatic reasons for very neoliberal capitalist reasons. Um, So I think that's important to understand. And my book has lots of ideas on what businesses can do when it comes to their employees to help create and foster um, a greater sense of connection. You know, from, you know, some really quite easy things to implement, at least once we're back in the office, like eating together. So lots of research which shows that um, when people eat together, they feel more bonded. There was research done in Chicago with firefighters, companies of firefighters who ate together, didn't only feel more bonded, they actually performed twice as well as companies of firefighters who didn't. So that's a simple thing companies can do once um, once they are back in the office, or at least a number of days a week in the office. Um, but also um, picking up on your point about kindness, and yes, we share this, that we really see kindness as a virtue, but also as something that, again, is um, 
makes sense for businesses to foster and encourage amongst their employees. Cisco, the global tech company, they have a scheme whereby anyone up or down the company can nominate anyone else who's been particularly kind or helpful um, for a cash reward of up to $10,000. Cisco, you know, I don't think, you know, I think promoting this culture of kindness and care goes along, has gone a long way in uh, making Cisco's turnover of employees be half the industry average and also um, helps account for why they've been voted the best company in the world to work for by their employees for four years running. Um, I'm not in, on Cisco's payroll, by the way, but I was impressed by um, finding all of this out about them in my research. Um, when it comes to governments, um, I do think there are things they can they can do, actually. I, you know, of course, I don't. I don't think they should be subsidising religion um, either. But um, but I do think investing in public libraries, in youth clubs, in community centres at local levels is important, and is something that governments could and should be doing. I think taking on social media companies in a meaningful way is important. I do believe that in many ways, social media companies are the tobacco companies of the 21st century. And I do believe that they should be regulated as as such. And I know that in the United States, there is growing support across the aisle for greater regulation of social media companies. If you're creating a public bad that in many ways they are, you know, it's makes sense that the um, that the market itself can't address this and that government can step in. Um, when it what comes would to regulation like, would you favor? Now? I mean, I'm, so, I, I'm open-minded about, I'm intrigued by the idea of, of things we might do. And well, we have a, it hasn't been released yet, but there's a episode coming out soon with Glenn Weil who has some very radical ideas on, on how uh, we might reorganize business. But what would you, I mean, as you point out, they make their money by by us using their product. They're mm-hmm. really good at it. Mm-hmm. And m- people, if you ask them, you know, do you want to have less Facebook or less TikTok or less Instagram? They'd say, no, I like it again. I want more. So how's the government going to wh- – what would you have them do? So I think it's interesting to look at what the United Kingdom government is doing at the moment um, to give some kind of quite concrete – Uh, put some concrete um, thoughts on how this might work in the United Kingdom. There's a bill currently going through Parliament called the Online Safety Bill. And this bill is going to um, impose a really significant duty of care on social media companies um, when it comes to uh, things on their platforms that create psychological or physical harm. So um, having very punitive, significant fines um, on companies where um, where users, as a result, um, experience significant physical or psychological harm. I think that is something that makes sense, policies in that sort of direction. I also think there is a really legitimate um, case to be made for um, banning addictive social media for children. I'm um, in the same way that we would ban tobacco products to be sold to children, thereby putting the onus on these tech, social media tech companies to actually develop new products, which are less addictive um, for this market, um, for this demographic. So I think there are, I think there are meaningful interventions that can be made that could have a material impact on um, on how deleterious they currently are uh, when it comes to so many people's lives. So just well, the incentives are the incentives are pretty clear, right? The incentives are, are they make their money on advertising. The money they make from advertising depends on how many people are on their screens and for how long. Yes. So, and they've got data on that, and they can figure out what makes more versus less. Mm. Again, I think the challenge is people do seem to like it. Um, and you and I, you confess in the book that you do you have a smartphone. Smoking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they do, right. Um, well, some of them, uh, at least for a while. Yeah. The other way to think about this, and, and I like what Arnold Kling wrote about it um, 
a while back. He said, if you don't like Facebook, you, thought you find it parts of it unpleasant or inadequate or whatever it is, build a better one. And it's it's hard because there's a big network and we care about how many people we interact with on these platforms. But you think, you know, you, you want to have, you want to encourage these firms to make more child-friendly, less addictive products. You'd think they could. Uh, the, someone well, else could. Someone yeah. else could. I mean, part of, the, part of the challenge here, of course, and this is something which I know that the FTC is currently um, going after the social media companies for, is that they... Um, you know, buy up um, small companies that are innovating and yep. um, and then, you know, so they are essentially buying their potential competition and stifling it. So, you know, there's a real monopolistic problem here, which, you know, even, you know, strong ad, which especially actually for strong advocates of capitalism should be jarring. Um, so, um so, so taking them on is, I think, a worthy, a worthy pursuit, which would have a meaningful impact. And, and then, of course, there's what we can do as individuals. And, and so much, so much that we can do as individuals. Um, you know, there was a fascinating initiative done in Germany that I write about in my book by. Um, a group of journalists at a newspaper did cite who became worried about growing um, political fragmentation in Germany. And they launched an initiative, Deutschland spricht, where they paired up in a kind of political Tinder type way, as they called it, people with radically different political views. So it was an opt-in scheme, and but they had thousands of people across Germany opting in to be part of this scheme. So you had people who were really anti-immigrant with people who were really pro-immigration. They had people who were anti the Euro with people who were pro the Euro, real different extremes and different socioeconomic groups, socio um, CEOs with trade unionists being paired up. And then these people came together. That was all they had to do. They had to meet up for two hours and talk. That was it. And it was fascinating what happened just after this two hour exchange, people's views of the other radically changed. They saw the other as someone much more like them, often with shared concern, actually often around family. Yeah, um, sure. and, um, and they also said that they'd be much more willing to invite someone like that um, to a social setting um, in the future. And also interestingly, that they trusted Germans in general more. Um, so I think, you know, this really exemplifies this point and it's something we're all, we all should be charged to do really, because it's easy to get lazy and, um, you know, only hang out with people like you. Um, but, you know, really to try and look for ways where we do interact with and rub up with people who are different to us. And we talked about religion. Of course, it was, you know, it was often in the church, for example, at the Sunday service where people would meet people who were very different to sure. them and interact. And we don't, we're not having enough of those opportunities. So that's something that we can do. Another thing we can do is... Yeah, we've talked about how addicted we are to our phones and our devices. We are, but we can try and take more control. I, for example, do a digital Sabbath. Um, every Saturday, I am off my um, devices. I don't check my emails. Um, and I really try and stick to that, partly so that I can just be more present with my partner, my family, with those around me. And, and I try and do this in the evenings as well, have a cutoff time put my phone so that it's not in arm's reach. So that's something else we can do. We can support our local communities. And that is part more. And that's partly about supporting our local shops, our local businesses, you know, these places, these third spaces, you know, which do play hugely important roles, these small businesses in anchoring and nurturing our communities. So, you know, shop in, in, at your local independent bookstore if you have one, you know, frequent your local cafe if there is one. And if, of course, in these times it's safe to do so and, you know, really challenge ourselves about this shift to a contactless existence, to doing everything on Zoom on Grubhub on Walt um, um, that we have been doing accelerated by the pandemic, but challenge ourselves so that we don't um, choose convenience 
over community inadvertently because I think there's a real danger of that. And then, and then I think we also, given the levels of loneliness right now, given the pandemic and given how many people are struggling, you know, really think, is there anyone in your own network who might be feeling lonely? And if there is, you know, just pick up the phone to them, even just give them a phone call, even just send them a text. If you can meet them, um, meet up with them, but just showing someone that you're thinking about them that they matter to you can make a huge difference to how they feel. Now let's close with um, let's close with with what you, we might call the uh, opposite of loneliness. We've talked a little bit about family. We talked a little bit about, about religion, but tribalism, the tribal aspect of our humanity, is really the the flip side of of loneliness. We want to be with our tribe and. Our tribe could be our immediate family. It could be our religious um, fellow people who share religion. But there are other tribes, and and people have started. I think in the with the challenges that religion and family have been facing, people have turned to other forms of tr other tribes to join. Some of those are political. I've, I often talk about the sports tribes. It's a common way that people feel connected to other people. Um, I've suggested that sports is healthier than politics, but people don't agree with me necessarily. I respect that. My and I want to mention would. what <laughs> my husband would. Yeah, okay. Uh, he's not a, is he a Tottenham fan by any chance? Liverpool. Oh, well. Anyway, but I, I was going to say, and it's very brave of you to come on to Econ Talk, knowing that you're going to meet someone who doesn't totally agree with you on everything. Um, but anyway, I, um, let's talk about tribalism at, and, and how I think in modern times, I, I think it's the flip side of loneliness. We're, we're searching for tribes to be part of. In most of human history, they came naturally to us. They were our physical neighbors because that's, that's who we lived around and near. They were our family members because that's how we got by. They were our religion because that's how we found meaning. And for a lot of people, those aren't available anymore. So we're looking for something else. Um, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, we are looking for people who are like us or who have shared interests to us, shared passions. Um, and one of the one of the things I write about in the book is that even before the pandemic or before the pandemic, we were really seeing a kind of real upsurge in things like people who were meeting up to do crafting together or painting together. Or I, I do a weekly. I'm part of a weekly improv group where we would meet up in person and do improv every week together. So shared passions, shared beliefs, sure. Um, those are definite ways people can feel less lonely. And if you're feeling lonely yourself, you know, think about, is there something you're passionate about? And nowadays when things are, a lot's happening virtually, there is stuff happening virtually in that realm as well. But I think the challenge with tribes is that, you know, my hope is that we don't just find our connection within our own tribe, but that we aim to also think about how can we create bridges between tribes? How do we move forward so that we don't only feel connected to people who are like us, but so that we're at least willing to connect with, engage with, listen to, and hear from people who are not like us as well. And I think that's the challenge and also the opportunity. Well, it's a nice thing to aspire to. I'm a big fan of it and I'm a big fan of respecting people. I try to be a fan of respecting people who aren't like me, but I'm not sure that works so well for human beings. Um, we, we spent most of our evolutionary history surrounded by our tribe and being either afraid of or fighting <laughs> the people who aren't like us. So it seems to me that that that, that human urge to belong is so fundamental that we, we kind of have to fix that. In fact, well, one, one, could one way we can, one, you know, one thing that comes um, in one of the things that I looked at in my book, you know, I think, and this is something where, you know, I think there is potentially a role for government to play, but it doesn't have to be government, is in engineering opportunities for people to do things together. Because when people do things with people who are different to them, that's when they often find what they have in common. So, um, you know, so whether it is just like that German scheme where you're sitting and speaking to someone, but where, if you're actually doing something, so classes of kids from different socioeconomic groups and backgrounds, um, 
you know, doing shared sports together, for example. Or in France, there was a scheme um, that President Macron trialed of civic service for um, 16 year olds, where people from very different backgrounds you know, lived together, did voluntary activities together, worked together, had to learn to coexist together. So I think, um, I think you're right. Our instinct might be in our kind of evolutionary history, might be pointing us to only feel connected with people like us. But I think in the um, 21st century, we can move beyond that and we can actually engineer ways and help people to find those ties and connections and commonalities with people different to them too. Yeah, I'm all for that. I think the challenge is if you don't satisfy that first one, you're in trouble. If you don't, right, if, if you can't feel a sense of belonging, you're, we're in trouble. I agree with you, though. And, and, Once, the, and the state is, I mean, this is where we would perhaps disagree, but, you know, the state has, can play a part in helping more people feel that they belong. And part of the, um, you know, part of the rise of, um, you know, the populist right, of course, in recent years has been because they on the right were speaking to a group of people who did feel very disenfranchised, yeah, economically marginalized, their communities kind of underinvested in, broken, falling down. Yep. And so, you know, so again, there is community doesn't just happen. Um, it needs an infrastructure and there is and there is a role that governments can play. It doesn't only have to be governments. Businesses can play that role. Churches used to often play that role. We can play that role in nurturing our communities. But at the end of the day, the problem is so serious that I think each party playing a part could make a huge difference. Yeah, I guess the risk is that, you know, government can make it worse too. You know, I think a lot of the rise in populism is, is you said, is people who felt disconnected and they wanted to feel connected to their country again, whether it was Brexit or uh, Trump, the Trump phenomenon in the United States. They felt they, that their country, they didn't feel part of their country anymore. The, the, the notion of being English or American felt alien. And I think in America, the narrative that those folks hold versus the narrative that people on the other side of the ideological fence feel are just not very reconcilable. And I don't want government actually to have anything to do. I'd like government to get out of that because I think it's going to, if we're not careful, we're going to end up in some kind of um, very disruptive, irreconcilable differences between those folks if one side triumphs in, in, in you know, the nature of, of what government's trying to achieve. So I think it's a bit, it's a big challenge. Uh, I'm not, I don't mean to suggest there's a magic, easy way to get it done. I, I'm, I could even imagine a role for government, but, it, but I think we have to be really careful. Well, I mean, you know, as I said uh, uh, earlier, having kind of cut my teeth in my, the working world um, in Russia, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, the danger of excessive government intervention is extremely clear and real. But I think, but I think we can, we are both essentially kind of supporting um, or accepting, as of course Adam Smith did, that there are times when government can and should intervene. That and and you know, but but government on its own will never be the solution. To the loneliness crisis, we as individuals clearly also do have roles to play. My guest today has been Narina Hertz. Her book is The Lonely Century. Narina, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.